Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. A new study shows spending a lot of money on a wedding ring actually increases your chances of divorce? We interview marriage expert Morg Fertel, who has a best-selling program on seven secrets to fixing your broken marriage. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Dr. Chaps. We're gonna have a newsmaking interview today with marriage expert Mort Fertel, who's written a program to give you a really strong marriage. We'll do that in our next segment, but first the news. USA Today reports, money doesn't buy happily ever after, according to a new study from Emory University. The study found the amount of money that people spend on weddings and particularly on engagement rings is actually inversely associated with how long they stay married. The study does not state that spending more on weddings causes people to be more likely to divorce. However, it does highlight a relationship between expenses and the length of marriage and that relationship is inverse. The more expensive, the shorter the length of marriage. To conduct the study, two Emory University economics professors studied more than 3,000 people who were married or had been married at some point in their lives. The study found that spending between $2,000 and $4,000 on an engagement ring, which is a higher amount of money in this study, was associated with also an increase in the hazard of divorce. As compared to poorer people, or maybe just poorer uh, grooms who are gonna propose to brides can't afford a big carrot on that diamond. They only spend between $500 and $2,000, but those marriages last longer. What's the explanation? Researchers suggest that uh, wedding costs could contribute to future marital stress. So don't spend a lot of money on a big wedding. Save that money for down the road when the two of you don't need to be fighting about the lack of money. Uh, survey found that spending less than $1,000 on a wedding, I mean, that's not much to put on a good wedding, but it also noticeably reduces the chance that there's gonna be stress about potential wedding debt compared to people who spend between $5,000 and $10,000 who report an enormous amount of stress because of their wedding date. But don't tell that to the average American who budgeted, can you believe the average wedding expense in America is $29,858 on wedding expenses according to a 2013 survey by The Knot. The Emory survey found that factors associated with lower risk of divorce were a lot of wedding guests and going on a big honeymoon. Well, uh, that's the news. Our thanks to USA Today for that report. The Bible says this in Ecclesiastes chapter five, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray in Jesus' name that all those in America who choose to take those vows would not end them in divorce and would make wise spending decisions. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a short break. When we come back, Mort Fertel is gonna tell you the seven secrets to a happy marriage. Discerning the spirits that rule our politicians, Dr. Chaps will be right back. As a Christian minister, I believe the Bible and I believe in spiritual gifts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 that the gift of discerning of spirits is available to you. The ability to see angels or demons or the Holy Spirit. In fact, I've written two amazing books that I want you to have today. And you can visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org to get either one of these resources. The first is my PhD dissertation on this particular topic. It's called How to See the Holy Spirit and Angels and Demons. Ignatius of Loyola on the Gift of Discerning of Spirits in Church Ethics. If you want an exciting theology book that's challenging and intellectual, that goes into the classic theology of Ignatius of Loyola, how he was influenced by men like John Cashin and Thomas Akempis, 
how he influenced later theologians like Carl Rahner and Timothy Gallagher, then you will love this resource, maybe for your pastor, or if you're a counselor, or a serious Bible student, this is a theology book and you're gonna love it. Or maybe you want something more fun. I've also written a different book, which is more of a popular book. Uh, it's called The Demons of Barack Obama, and it applies my theology of discerning of spirits to the 44th president of the United States. I used an article written by my friend David Barton on 50 events in his presidency, and I tried to discover, is he being influenced by the Holy Spirit, or by angels, or by maybe some other spirits? What is behind the president? So if you want a popular book that's fun to read, it's available for $20, or if you want an academic book that could be used for serious Bible students, it's available for $35 or maybe you want both of these, they're both available for $50. A, a donation of any amount will go towards sending these books to you. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org and get both of these resources for your family. Defending your religious freedom, here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps. I'm joined again by my new friend, Mort Fertel from Baltimore, Maryland. He is a marriage expert only because he's had to fix his own marriage, as he described. Uh, Mort, your program has now been endorsed by Dr. Stephen Covey and Dr. John Gray. Over one, me one million people have subscribed to your free report, Seven Secrets to Fixing Your Marriage. And how do people find that again? Marriagefitness.com. Fantastic. So you were talking about the four steps to phenomenal love. You said the first one is to put love first. What are the other three? Two is to give presence. Uh, that's spelled P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. In other words, to give to your spouse in a way that they feel your presence in the present. And the way to do that is by giving to them in a, uh, in a way that they really feel understood. It's gifts that you can only give them because you uniquely understand who they are. The third secret or the third, third step is to move from me to we. And this means not being selfish, joining each other in activities, in hobbies, in solving problems, in making decisions, being a team, being a unit. And the fourth is what I call save yourself. And what I'm referring to there is to manage very carefully your relationships outside the marriage and not to let them sort of soak the connection from your marriage. In other words, you can only connect with, you can only connect deeply with one person in your And if you start to connect deeply with others outside the marriage, it interferes with the relationship, with the marital relationship. Fantastic. Now, in another booklet, or, or maybe there's some chapters, you mentioned 43 keys to a great marriage. We don't have time to mention all 43 today, but can you summarize what that is? Well, maybe I'll just give you an example of one. Maybe that's the best way to answer this question because I don't know if I could summarize all 43. <laughs> but one would be, you know, unfortunately, as time goes on in a marriage, sometimes people become experts at catching their spouse doing something wrong. They don't miss a thing. And they mention everything to their spouse and their spouse ends up feeling highly criticized, condemned, complained about. And so one really productive thing you can do for your marriage every single day is to make sure you catch your spouse doing something right. No matter how many sins they might be committing, no matter how many things they might be doing wrong, my chances are good they're doing something right. And you'd be amazed at how much more mileage you get in your marriage if you mention that one thing or those few things instead of the whole laundry list of things that you're unhappy about that might encourage them to keep on doing the right thing over and over again. So that's a good encouragement. Now, uh, this month you have this uh, brand new idea, four signs that your spouse may be getting ready to divorce you. And I'm just gonna mention the first one that you listed, the zero conflict relationship. If you claim that we never fight, beware because that's not good. There's conflict in every marriage and if it's not out in the open, then it's bottling up inside of your spouse and eventually it's going to erupt. What, what does that mean? It means in certain marriages, there are, uh, there's a people pleaser. 
And this people pleaser, this conflict avoider, is agreeing to everything. They're capitulating over and over again. Their spouse thinks that they have this person's agreement. We get along fine. We never fight. He goes along with everything. But in fact, there's this resentment building up inside. He does have an opinion, but for whatever reason, in his relationship with you, he doesn't feel comfortable voicing it. He did want the color on the couch to be different, but he feels that you somehow dominated that decision. And the more the years go by and the more types of things like this that occur, the more resentment builds up inside this spouse until it eventually erupts. And very often people come to me in total marital crisis. Their marriage is on the brink of divorce and they say, I didn't even see it coming. I thought we were fine. I thought we got along great. But in fact, for years, this resentment was building up. So you should allow healthy conflict so that you air everything out. The number two sign that your spouse is about to divorce is that uh, you're not having sex anymore. Can you talk about that? People uh, get in situations in their marriage where they're not having sex. And very often they justify it. They rationalize it. We're busy with the kids. We're too tired. My husband works hard. Whatever the case may be, different sex-starved marriages, um, uh, people rationalize why that has become the reality in their marriage in different ways. But the bottom line is that if you're not having sex in your marriage and one spouse has a reasonable sex drive or has an active sexual imagination, that is not sustainable. They're going to lose patience. They're going to lose hope and they're going to stop using whatever coping mechanisms they may have used. And that is another thing that often blows up a marriage. Now, the third sign that your spouse may be getting ready to divorce you, you call it the perfect partnership. Uh, in other words, you're running your family like a business. You're pay, uh, paying your bills, raising the kids, doing your chores, uh, but it's not fulfilling because there's no intimacy. What does that mean? Yeah, the goal of a marriage is not efficiency, it's intimacy. And things could be in order. Everything could be in place. The kids could be growing up nicely, all the bills could be paid, and the house could be looking perfect. But if you're not close, if you're not emotionally connected, if you're not having fun together, if you're not having sex together, and if you don't feel like this is my soulmate, then it doesn't matter how much things are in order and how great life outside the marriage is, if the marriage itself, the relationship itself, separate from everything else is not fulfilling, it's not exciting, if you're not connected to your spouse, then somebody eventually is gonna give up. Somebody eventually is gonna get fed up. And that's often when a marriage explodes. And then the last of the four signs that your spouse may be getting ready to divorce you is verbal venom. Uh, we've all heard this, the phrase, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Uh, is that true? That is a lie. That is a total lie. Words hurt. They hurt big time. And if one person in a marriage is the kind of person that's constantly cursing, condemning, complaining, or criticizing, and that goes on and on and on, your spouse might be the kind of person that seems to be taking it. But eventually, they're going to grow tired of it. They're not going to take that forever. And very often that leads to somebody saying, enough, I'm finished with being treated this way. So all four of these dynamics are different dynamics that I see and people come to me and they just can't believe that this is happening to them. They didn't see it coming, they were blindsided, when in fact, one of these dynamics was often brewing in the background for years prior to them finding out that their spouse is now having an affair, wants to separate, filed for divorce, whatever the case may be. That's it, well, we're out of time, but thank you, Mort. Again, your book is Marriage Fitness, and you have a free program people can get uh, at marriagefitness.com. What do they do? They, they get on an email list, or how does that happen? Yeah, they just enter their first name and email address, and uh, we'll send them the seven secrets for fixing your marriage. Fantastic, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon and God bless you in Jesus name. We'll Thank take you. a short break and we'll be back after this. Are you pro-life? 
Do you believe that abortion kills innocent children? If so, I want you to take action today and sign a petition at PrayInJesusName.org. Here's three petitions we need you to sign. The number one is to stop Planned Parenthood from getting your taxpayer dollars. Did you know they've received now $487 million in your taxpayer dollars? I don't think that's right. They use that money to facilitate 329,445 abortions, not really to pay for adoption or mammograms, but just to kill innocent children. Sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. Here's number two petition we want you to sign, and that's to defund Obamacare. This bad healthcare law is now forcing Christian employers to pay for contraception, sterilization, and abortion pills free of charge for all their employees, or the Christian employer has to pay a $100 fine per day per employee. That's gonna bankrupt our friends like the Hobby Lobby Corporation, Christian business owners, and even Catholic hospitals now are being forced to pay for abortions. The Obama administration is now promoting the Plan B abortion pill over the counter for children as young as seven years old. Here's petition number three we need you to sign at PrayInJesusName.org to help pass Senate Bill 583, the Life Begins at Conception Act. This personhood bill, introduced by my friend, Senator Rand Paul, can actually defend life and help overturn Roe versus Wade. Take action today. I know you care about the unborn, but please sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. We will fax that petition free of charge to your congressman. Sign a petition at PrayInJesusName.org. Take action today if you're pro-life. I'm joined today in the studio by Dr. Ellen Keyes, but first, let's discuss the idea of personhood. This new political movement among the pro-life community, uh, specifically American Right to Life and many state-by-state uh, -state initiatives, ballot initiatives, to define the word person as beginning at conception. When a man and a woman procreate and there is a, a sperm and an egg that forms a zygote, you have a person. Well, does the law define that as a person? And if it did, would it be protected? Here's a map of the personhood legislation, most recently at Victory in North Dakota, where the North Dakota Senate not only passed, but is now put on a ballot for the people of North Dakota to vote in 2014, November of 2014, to define life is beginning at conception, which would effectively ban abortions in North Dakota. That is constitutional, according to Justice Blackmun, who wrote the Roe versus Wade decision back in 1973. Here's a quote from Justice Blackmun, who said this, if this personhood, a suggestion of personhood is established, then the Roe versus Wade case, of course, collapses, because the fetus's right to life would be specifically guaranteed by the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Well, a bill to enact that specific language in federal law has been introduced by Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, Senate Bill 583, the Life Begins at Conception Act, and we have a petition you can sign today at PrayInJesusName.org. Here with a comment is a pro-life hero and my personal, uh, a man that I respect that I've come to know over the years who has mentored me, Dr. Alan Keyes, former ambassador to the United Nations and pro-life personhood leader. Welcome, Alan. Well, thank you very much. And I have been very heartened by the success that the personhood movement has uh, and enjoyed in the last little while. And the fact that it represents a kind of awakening of a larger group of people who think of themselves as pro-life to the fundamentals. Because I think part of the reason that some of the strategies others have been trying don't work is because in point of fact, though, the pro-life movement is solidly based in an understanding that derives its truth from the relationship with God a lot of the tactics and strategy that people have been employing had nothing to do with that. The personhood movement, however, is rooted in a simple understanding of what our humanity is all about. And that understanding is stated in simple forms right there at the beginning of the scripture. When it says, in the image and likeness of God created he them. That male and female, Adam and Eve created in the image and likeness of God. The word person is actually related to a Latin word persona. And it referred specifically to the image that an actor carried in front of himself when he was portraying a character. So it means that you are reminded by that persona 
of who that actor represents, what that activity he's engaging in is about. And what is that? That is a reminder that human beings are here, as John Locke, one of the philosophers, the founders looked to greatly, said, we are here about our master's business. We are here as agents and representatives of the creator. And that was the fundamental idea that the Constitution and our whole understanding of rights and justice was based on. The personhood movement gets back to that in order to remind everyone, including people in the pro-life movement, that at the end of the day, our respect for that life in the womb is not just a function of our religious belief, our faith, our convenience, our consensus that we've reached with other people. Because as I've said before, human beings have agreed on a lot of evil. We know that. I especially am reminded of it by my heritage as a black American, but people looking at the Holocaust and at other things. Human beings have at various times agreed to do atrocity and pretend that it was somehow warranted by law and right. What I think the movement reminds us of is that the intrinsic worth of each and every human life isn't something that respects our will, whether it's our will as individuals or our will as a community. It is respecting God's will. And that therefore, we are bound to respect that unalienable right to life in whatever the stage of life we're dealing with. How does that contrast to the, the other, the, the liberal side of the pro-life movement, for example, by National Right to Life, who advocates incrementalism, or this idea that, uh, well, if you just do ultrasounds, then you can kill the baby, or if you just notify the parents, then you can kill the baby, and they don't have a strict personhood approach that defines life beginning at conception? Well, the great problem, and I've pointed this out many times over the years, if you are going to be concerned with the numbers of uh, people, babies that are killed, but you have lost sight of the reason why you are concerned when any given life is taken. It would be like counting to 100 without having established the meaning of the number one. Meaning to say that if the one doesn't matter, then a million ones don't matter either. It is like adding zero to itself at that point. So you cannot sustain the commitment to the pro-life cause if you have forgotten why it is that each and every human life has to be intrinsically respected. The personhood movement reminds us of why. Each and every life has to be respected because each and every person is made in the image and likeness of God, represents the will of God for the being of our humanity. If you forget that, then at some point it just becomes haggling over numbers, and over the course of a generation or two, you do realize that people will forget why the numbers are important, and will reach a stage where people will start to think, well, why should we worry more about killing a million babies than we worry about killing a million chickens to have them for dinner? And indeed, the whole thrust of our society now, partly on account of the triumph of the evolutionary ideology, but partly on account of the many ways in which we are debasing our understanding of human beings in order to treat them as instruments of our pleasure and of our profit and of our will. We are losing sight of the idea fundamental to the American understanding of right and justice, that each and every human being represents an instance of God's will, of God's intention that government and all human powers have to respect. We're gonna take a short break, but I wanna leave you with this scripture from Psalm 139. The Bible defines life beginning at the womb. It says, my substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes, God, your eyes saw our substance, being yet not perfect, but in your book, all of our members, every part of our body was written when it wasn't yet fashioned, when there were not yet any of them. Let's take a short break. We'll be back to talk about Obamacare. Why does the government pushing abortion pills on Christian businesses? Take a short break. Are you pro-life? Do you believe that abortion kills innocent children? If so, I want you to take action today and sign a petition at PrayInJesusName.org. Here's three petitions we need you to sign. The number one is to stop Planned Parenthood from getting your taxpayer dollars. 
Did you know they've received now $487 million in your taxpayer dollars? I don't think that's right. They use that money to facilitate 329,445 abortions, not really to pay for adoption or mammograms, but just to kill innocent children. Sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. Here's number two petition we want you to sign, and that's to defund Obamacare. This bad healthcare law is now forcing Christian employers to pay for contraception, sterilization, and abortion pills free of charge for all their employees, or the Christian employer has to pay a $100 fine per day per employee. That's gonna bankrupt our friends like the Hobby Lobby Corporation, Christian business owners, and even Catholic hospitals now are being forced to pay for abortions. The Obama administration is now promoting the Plan B abortion pill over the counter for children as young as seven years old. Here's petition number three we need you to sign at PrayInJesusName.org to help pass Senate Bill 583, the Life Begins at Conception Act. This personhood bill, introduced by my friend, Senator Rand Paul, can actually defend life and help overturn Roe versus Wade. Take action today. I know you care about the unborn, but please sign a petition today at PrayInJesusName.org. We will fax that petition free of charge to your congressman. Sign a petition at PrayInJesusName.org. Take action today if you're pro-life. Our thanks again to Mort Fertel for that inspiring interview. I encourage you to get his materials. Please visit our website and help us stay on the air at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 9, everyone should give in your heart what you've decided to give, not reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful giver. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. Introducing FactsCongress.com. Do you care about politics, defending pro-life causes, traditional marriage, and religious freedom? At FactsCongress.com, you can create any petition to Congress, and we will convert your e-petition instantly to a real fax paper on your congressman's desk. And the best part? It's free. Want your voice heard by multiple congressmen? At FactsCongress.com, we can blast your petition to all 535 congressmen and senators instantly. And you don't even need a fax machine. Not only do we deliver your petitions instantly, but with our dashboard feature, you can quickly recruit friends on Facebook and Twitter to co-sign your petition. Do you care about a particular cause? You can build a virtual army of supporters at FactsCongress.com. Do you lead a church, faith-based organization, or PAC? We can even help you do fundraising. It's free. Just visit FactsCongress.com and try it out. Make a difference. Sign any petition today at FactsCongress.com. FactsCongress.com. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray in Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.